Hello and welcome to this webinar, which is a short review of the Futsal World Cup, which has just taken place in Lithuania. The plan is to look at some of the general tournament observations and then see how they might impact on our coaching as we think about how we might help individuals develop based on these themes. My name is Ian Parks. I'm a youth coach developer in the Southwest and also have responsibility to support pro clubs, uh, pro club academies with Futsal. I'm delighted today to be joined by uh, John Tapia Owens from On The Court magazine. He and his brother David, who can't be with us today, are founders and editors of the magazine, which for those who aren't aware, focuses primarily on technical and tactical analysis of players, teams and coaches from various leagues. So we thought it would be good to hear their thoughts on this World Cup. So welcome, John. Welcome. Cheers. Thanks a lot um, for having us. As I say, it's really good to to have this opportunity to, to speak about the, the World Cup and give our feedback and thoughts um, around it, really. Good stuff. And am I right in saying the next edition of the magazine will feature analysis of the competition? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, currently sort of digesting everything that, that's gone on. We've got, got a lot of data points uh, that just compile and putting that together. Um, yeah, and it'll be out shortly. Cool. So if you enjoy the content in this, then do look out for that magazine. John is also head coach of Bloomsbury Futsal Club, who play in the top tier of English futsal, the FA National Futsal Series. They were runners up in the summer showdown last season, so he's got plenty of experience to share with us today. So let's get started, John, on to the content. Can you kick us off with your three general observations? Yeah, so... Um... Something that's been trending a lot in the, in the past previous seasons, and you probably saw it in, in the Champions League a few years ago as yeah. well, is the, the intensity and physicality that, that's starting to really appear in the game. Um, I know a, a semi-final that, that one of the English refs, Mark Burkett, ref between Inter and Sporting was already very intense, and that's leading us now into sort of the modern era of futsal, which um, from the World Cup, a lot of teams were, were high-pressing, especially towards the, the latter ends of the tournament. Once it started to to really go down into those top eight teams um, in the world currently. Um, intensity was high and, and what it's starting to lead to is more individual battles on court. Um, so a lot of teams are now starting to defend with individual uh, press. So that means that it's man to man where you don't exchange players as opposed to the, the traditional uh, sort of Spanish model. Argentinian model, which is man-to-man uh, -man with exchanges, where you're maintaining that uh, exchange in the front line um, and try and maintain that high pressing line. Uh, so you can really see these two images here from the same game, the two teams and how they set up differently in, in, a, in a very similar situation. So in the top left, you've got Russia um, pressing Argentina, ball is on the wing, and you can see there a 1v1 battle on the wing. And you can see the space there that is vacated by um, both Argentina and Russia, with Russia going touch tight effectively to their defenders and allowing those 1v1 battles to take place. Um, as opposed to Argentina, you can see at the bottom there, ball is in the wing with the player. Um, and you've there you've got a top two, and you call those effectively man-to-man. -man, and then you've got a cover who is a bit, little bit more zonal, and you'll have a fix at the back as well who will be on that central axis. Um, and, the, and that is really to maintain that high line of pressure. Um, as well as you'll see that top Russian player in that second image there, um, which is being marked by the number 11 from Argentina, that player will cut through. And what will happen there is that that exchange will happen if that pressure is good enough on the ball. Um, so it allows their different types of techniques in regards to following your man in the top left or deciding whether to follow exchange your man in the bottom right. And it creates two different, very uh, different problems and solutions as well. Yeah, some great images there to, to show those examples from the World Cup. What do you think this means for individuals then? If you're an individual in that uh, top left picture without exchange and you're that Russian player defending the, the Argentinian with the ball, what's the sort of things we're going to be looking for as coaches to be helping our, our players with? Well, first, first and foremost, it's accountability. A lot more accountability on the individuals and on the players as defenders um, to be able to defend those 1v1 scenarios on the ball and to be able to defend your player in possession but off the ball. So if that player is cutting through or moving, you're going to have to really follow that player and see what they're doing. So if that ball is is transitioning backwards and you're, um, one of your teammates is getting beaten, then you've got to return and recover, of course, to get those principles of getting behind the ball. Within the same moment, you've also got to be aware of your man as well. 
very different to what we see in the the bottom right, for example, which the one v one battle is is not as intense as you can clearly see. And that player knows that if he gets beaten there one v one, he's got number three there um, to really cover up that one v one mistake um, or that advantage that that Russia will have gained from beating that player. Again, very different in regards to number 11 for Argentina. He's got to now monitor as well if, if that player is cutting through. Is it an option to exchange? Is it an option to, to follow? Depending on the pressure of the ball. So again, you, you're starting to think a lot more tactically, whereas uh, the Russian defence, you could argue, is a little bit more technical in regards to 1v1 battles and physical because you're going to have to run a lot and make sure that um, you're competing um, on all levels with the, the attacking team. You mentioned physicality there. I think contact's important, isn't it, when there's no exchange in terms of blocking runs, stopping one-twos. If they're trying to play round you, you're going to have to take that step back, get your arm up and stop those runs. Yeah, I suppose gonna... even with exchanges, sorry, even with exchanges, at that number 11 you're talking about there, if that Russian player in the middle runs across, he's probably still going to get some contact on him just to disrupt that flow to give his mate behind him a bit more time. 100%. Again, it goes down to two very different types of disrupting that trajectory of or or running path, um, which you might call it. So in the bottom right, where you just mentioned rightly about the exchange, if that player is going to exchange through, you might touch them slightly in regards to without pushing, of course, um, but you might block their run slightly and then exchange. So you want to be cutting off the passing line uh, to the far player initially before you exchange that player on then in the top left image um again if that player that is now in a 1v1 battle played the ball inside to his teammate um and now you're exposed in a one two scenario or what we call a wall pass scenario again that player would have to potentially turn their body um, block their run slightly and block their the attacking players run um so they don't gain that spatial advantage um in behind them so two di very different types of battles um, in regards to exchanging and how you use your physicality to, to really stop those running through. Yeah, and that Portuguese, um, sorry, Argentina 11 there in that bottom right again, also an open body shape so he can see the player coming round and whether he's got exchange or not. Just thinking there, actually, I think this is key for player development. You know, that this we're seeing this observation of more pressing higher, potentially with less cover. I think for player development on my travels, I do still see a fair number of teams defending on the halfway line. And I understand this. It helps reduce space. It probably reduces the number of goals that you're going to concede. Uh, and it does help players understand discipline and cover. But I do think for player development, if we're asking players to go and press and be more vulnerable in 1v1s, you know, they're going to leave more space for the opponents. But it's going to encourage players to be better 1v1 defenders and and also encourage coaches to get better at helping coaches with the details of these situations. You know, flipping it on its head, I'm, I'm just thinking now, also means the player on the ball is under more pressure. So they've got to be better on the ball, manipulate it better, know what they're going to do before they get it. So rather than that receiving on the halfway line with time and space, where you know the defenders might not come after you, it, it really challenges players to, to have to develop those skills, both in possession and out of possession. And if that's the way the game's going, as we're seeing here, then we're preparing them for the game of the future. Yeah, 100%. It really touches on those four corners um, from the FA model as well, which is the tech ta tactical situations, the physical situations as well, um, and, and the game understanding. So say, for example, in the, in the 1v1 scenarios there, um, you're putting the player under a lot more pressure on the ball. That player now has to manipulate the ball either to, to beat the man or to maintain the ball and try and open up passing lines in certain other areas. Again, you flip it, like you said, defensively, and you will become better 1v1 defenders, knowing that you don't have cover potentially, or if you want to work with exchanges, knowing that you have a, a sort of limited cover as well. Um, but it really puts the heinous on the on the players and accountability on the players to become effectively better players as well. Now, the flip side of that is that players could become used to these types of defences, and when they face lower block defences that you mentioned before, different problems are created, different solutions are created and players are only used to one thing or the other. And I yeah. think there's a, there's a, there is a space for both where some of our, for example, our under 16s, 19s at the dev, uh, dev team are very, very capable of now breaking pressurized defenses because that's how we train and that's how we, our model is. 
Um, but it becomes very difficult for them at the moment because they're in their youth development phase to really understand how to break low block defences and how to manipulate space when it is very much reduced. Um, so there's, I say there's a real argument for both there. That's a great point. Good point. Right, on to the second observation then, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so um, again, a high proportion of goals, um, especially in, the, in this World Cup, uh, came from our um, open play. And so that doesn't include set pieces. So the other 40% will come from set pieces, which was 25%. And uh, fly goalkeeper or numerical advantage. So 5v4 or red card scenarios, 4v3. Um, again, you could argue that they are, they are open play. But these stats really include the, the counter attacks. Uh, so whether that's low block counter attacks, so nicking the ball and then breaking over a large distance or those high pressure moments where you can steal the ball high and score. Or creation. Um, so what we're starting to see is that teams are creating a lot more um, as well as counter-attacking a lot more from higher situations, um, leading to, to direct goals from open play. Um, it's really evident then from the from the winners, Portugal, that 70% that of their goals came from open play. So only six goals uh, came from set plays in the, in the whole tournament. And to give an indication, uh, zero corners, um, I think just before the final was, was the data that, w that we collected. Um, so real indicator of, of their individual qualities. So your players like Ricardinho, Pani, people like that, in regards to what they can create from, from open play um, to be able to score. Yeah, good point. I, I guess it's going back to what we just said. It's it's extremes, isn't it? We're not saying set pieces aren't important anymore. Um, they're still a fairly high percentage, one in four goals coming from a set piece. They're still important. But this idea of creation becoming a bigger part of the game is something to consider. Yeah, 100%. Again, um, there are some Spanish teams that, that a large portion of their goals come from set pieces and they're, they're real masters at that. Um to give you an indication, I think it was 30% at the at the last Euros 2018 were set pieces, now down to 25%. So it, it, it has gone down by about 5%. Um, doesn't seem like a large number, but it, it is still quite a proportion, um, which means that potentially teams are getting better at defending those set pieces um, and therefore and keepers are, are getting better at stopping those within and around the area. And therefore, teams are starting to have to create um, different scenarios in open play. Yeah, which means we need better individuals and and better players that can connect in twos and threes. So, yeah, good point. On to the third and final observation that you made at this stage. Yeah, so a lot of goals are coming uh, from distance as well. Um, I know we, we speak a lot about uh, within the six metre area. And you can see that the 40, around 40% 40 of the goals came within the area. Around 60% of the goals came from outside the area. I know there's a lot of those that are still within the 10 metre mark, but it's a, it's a good indicating factor of, of where shots are starting to be taken from. Um, and what we're seeing is that a lot of these also were with one touch. So the amount of shots that are coming from outside the area with one touch and still being scored um, is incredible. We always speak about it with inside the area. Um, but to give you an indication of how good players are getting at shooting and striking from outside the area, from open play scenarios. Um, again, Portugal, 67% of their goals came from outside of the area um, as a, and only 33% within the area. And what that it could lead to, again, is that once they're playing the higher teams and the, the teams that are at a higher level, they become much, much more harder to break down and to be able to get those opportunities within the area. And people are starting to take shots and be more direct from outside the area. It's effectively becoming a more physical and more direct game, um, which these stats seem to, to allude to as well. Yeah, I just thought I'd mention, I'm not sure if we've said that if you're not sure, the reason we're talking about Portugal and comparing them to the data is because they actually won the tournament. So for those that weren't aware of that, that's why we're highlighting Portugal. Now European and world champions. Yeah, correct. I was say, January might change. Yeah, let's see. So just building on that then, you talked about the one-touch finish coming from outside the D. What type of finishes are we seeing from outside? You know, is it laces? Is it side foot? I know Panny scored in the final and that was from a side foot, wasn't it, I think? But it was from distance. Yeah, so it's, it's very much varied. So you see um, Rodrigo from Brazil, toe pokes a lot of his finishes. Uh, you've got a very varied am amount of approaches and it's, it's what suits different players better and what they practiced over the years in regards to to how they want to finish. Um, so we're seeing a lot of, 
for example, the wingers and the back men, they're finishing a lot in one touch. And that's where those goals from outside the area are coming from, from setbacks from the pivots um, in different scenarios. In the top left, you can see there um, where the shot is coming from. It then deflects and, and goes effectively in. And that's why a lot of goals are being created as well, is that these shots from outside, um, a lot of bodies in front, it becomes difficult for the keeper. Number one to see can also create deflections um, and then, as I say, go in. Um, as opposed to if you compare that to pivots, for example, you can see there Farrell with the, um, in the bottom right image. He will receive the ball, take two or three touches um, to either engage those players and allow his other players to come into play or to try and turn the defender and then finish from around the outside of the box as well. And that's direct from a goal, goal throw um, as well. So you can already see how high the Japanese pre players were pressing and what they've got to recover now um, in terms of that 1v1 battle. Yeah, I'm just thinking, going back to those types of finishes, the lace is probably more common just because of the power generated and the way that these players can strike the ball is really quite impressive. Um, you mentioned the toe poke there. Would you say Rodrigo does that first time or is that where he's having a touch and running onto the ball and striking it? Uh, it's is a bit that... of both. So he scored a free kick in that manner and then there's also opportunities where he rolls it and then does exactly the same. I think the the best finish or the finishes that you're starting to see at the moment is what we wouldn't consider a laces in, in football. It's a space, it's a gap between the laces and the toe and they they generate a force from that and also like a dip. So similar to the, if you want to allude it back to football, like the, the Ronaldo or the David Luiz free kicks that you've started to see, yeah. is it's that gap between the laces and the toe. And they're starting to generate a power and curvature from that that causes the keepers all sorts of all sorts of issues. And then I'm thinking it's going to, in terms of practice, we, we've got to practice a variety of angles and, and distances and heights of the ball. Now, we touched on set pieces a little bit where the balls are chipped over and they're having to strike on the volley. This one here, the ball's coming. It might come square across, or as you said, it might come back mm. from a pivot. So, you know, these one-touch finishes are coming from a variety of serves, if you like. Yeah, 100%. And again, the goals are coming from really random and, and wide areas as well. So we're seeing goals scored from outside the box right in the, right in the corner. So you can see... A lot of the goals are coming from even the wider areas in terms of one-touch finishes as well. Um, and it's incredible to see how players are striking the ball um, from these sort of areas. Just to give you an indication, the goals in the other half are, are predominantly um, fly-keeper goals where players have nicked the ball and then aimed into an empty net. Um, yeah. And would you say um, the, the shots are high and hard or low and hard? Is there any, have you seen any correlation between that or is that not? I'd say, again, it, it, ball speed is always the, the key one. If it's hit hard, it's always going to cause the, the keeper's issues and, as well as causing deflections um, in any way. Um, the key would always be, to, again, to aim in the top corners or in the bottom corners, which is what is going to cause the keepers, um, again, as many issues as possible. OK, John, that's good. Let's move on to a practice because we've talked about what this means for coaches and we've talked about some of those observations. What practices might you use for players that you're working with at, at Bloomsbury that, that might help them score from open play, whether it be outside the D, first touch finish? Yeah, again, so we could go straight into a small game scenario or you could build it up with uh, way practice, as you see here. So something uh, potentially you could use is is locking the pivot into a zone with, with one defender and then creating a 2v2. Um, and then you can really put conditions on on those 2v2 as well. So utilising that the pivot can't potentially score maybe in the first one and that the player that plays it in has to be the one to score. Again, you could flip that and reverse it and say the player that plays the pass into the pivot, it has to be the opposite player that scores as well. So all of a sudden you're starting to generate those setbacks from the pivot and strikes from outside of that zone. Um, so finishing from wide areas, um, central areas, everything, uh, and really putting constraints on those two players to generate what you want to get from the practice. It doesn't necessarily mean that you then can't add in an extra player, so an extra pivot. Um, so two pivots against one defender to, to increase that repetition intensity, and then potentially evolve it on as well. So you can see there, there's already another goal with another keeper. You could add another pivot and a defender into that zone as well, turn it into a small-sided game once you've got 
what you want from the practice itself. Yeah, that's a good point, I think, about adding an extra pivot in for the attacking team, just particularly for working with younger players and they may struggle to hold the ball up in a 1v1. It just gives them that opportunity to, as you said, to get more repetition. But it's, it is good, I think, playing matched up. We've talked about trying to prepare players for the game. The game's matched up, so it's probably more important that we help them get better in that 1v1. But that, that's a really good suggestion. What was your thinking with the distances involved? And I know it looks here, you've locked them in at kind of six or seven metres. Why is it that distance? Why is it not further out, for example, or closer yeah. to the goal even? Mm. To be honest, we could take it potentially up to the six metre line. Um, any further out, I think that then it becomes very, very challenging. Um, and we saw from the recent stats um, where the goals were scored, they were scored outside the area, but in a proximity to the area. So you could bend that line. It doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line. It could be bent around again. So a lot of futsal courts will have the dotted handball foot uh, line around that as well. And you could potentially use that line. And all of a sudden, now you're finishing from those wide areas and those wide corner areas as well, okay. um, which, again, you can really use the what you've got and the court that you've got uh, to really create your own practice without having to put flats down as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And I suppose if you look at this picture where Farrell's further out, if you did want to work on, we've been talking there about working on sets for first time finishes. If you want to work on that three plus touch finish from the pivot, you might bring that line further out so that he's got or she's got more space to turn into and finish differently. So I think it's a good point that it will depend on what you're trying to get out of practice. 100%. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to the second part of this presentation, which is around the impacts that these... Uh, observations might have on individuals and how we as coaches might be able to help players to be able to play in the game that seems to be evolving. Just in terms of language, um, this top row goalkeeper GK fix a la pivot is probably language that's known across the world in terms of futsal, but just to try and give an, an idea of what it might be known in is England. You've got your goalkeeper, the fix is the back player, player that plays at the back, typically a defender maybe. Ala would be your winger, plays on the sides. And then pivot, I know in football is referred to sometimes as the deep midfield player that pivots, but in futsal, it is the striker or the target player. Just put a question here, John, about are the roles evolving? Do you, do you think that's the case in what you've seen from the World Cup? Yeah, I think, again, uh, it's been happening for a few years where players are becoming much more versatile. There's not players that particularly have one single role now with it, within a team. There are Players like Peter, for example, who people would argue is a pivot, but you find him dribbling in 1v1 scenarios on the wing. Uh, you'll find him at the back of the court very comfortable in, in a 4-0. So 4-0 is usually played with two back men, two wingers. Um, so at Inter, Mo Movistar, his, his uh, domestic club, or what was his domestic club before he went to Barca, um, he would very much be found in a 4-0 and then in a 3-1. Um, you've got players like Fer Drasler again, who played for Inter, um, who predominantly was a back man, and they would use him sometimes as a, as a pivot or a winger as well. So players are becoming much more versatile in terms of their skill sets, um, and it's offering, again, different problems and different solutions uh, for teams to cope and deal with, because as opposed to before you knew what player was going to be in certain areas or parts of the court, now players are starting to generate different um, opportunities and occupy different areas of the court that they probably didn't used to do. Which again, going back to player development is another reason for us, isn't it? With younger players to be playing them in different positions, even on the futsal court, that they find themselves higher up back to goal. They find themselves deeper, having to try and face forward under pressure or in wide areas in 1v1. So yeah, really interesting. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to look at each of these positions. We're going to look at them in and out of possession and talk about what we saw and, and what we might think it means for us as coaches. So starting with the pivot and in possession, what are the sort of things you noticed about them, either from the World Cup or from the previous few years that's starting to come that we can help them with? It's really the, the not necessarily the number of goals. We know that pivots or strikers will necessarily score more goals usually, but the number of chances that they're starting to create for the other uh, players. So when we spoke about the, the goals that were scored from outside the area, usually potentially from setbacks from the pivot, um, not necessarily just in central areas and wide areas. And that's what we said about the positioning. The pivots are starting to occupy more false pivot positions, what we call, in, in either channel or either wing. And that will really manipulate the defence spatially as well and allow other players to attack those spaces off the ball. 
But again, it also means that they might find themselves um, coming around and supporting um, a lot higher than they used to do. Um, sometimes the pivot will stay high. So like for Rao in here, um, who predominantly won't come back around. But like we said, Pito might come back around, enter into more of a 4-0 and find himself on the wing in, in winger uh, scenarios. Um, so that you can start to see those pivots starting to evolve. Esteban Filavante does a very, very similar job where he will find himself in the in the winger, in the wing positions on occasions. And you compare that to their other pivot, Pedro Toro, who finds himself centrally um, a little bit more in terms of that. But again, very capable at the back of the court. Um, in regards to their movement, you can start to see that they'll usually start behind the player or sometimes in front, depending on what they see and deem their skill set to be. Yeah, OK. And then I suppose it's the timing at which they, if they are behind the player, the timing at which they do step in front, probably based on the connection they've got with the player who's got the ball. Maybe when they lift their head or when they have their touch at their feet or look to play, that's when they step in front. But that timing becomes really important and helping players experiment with that timing because the defenders often mark in front trying to intercept. And then I suppose the techniques of how they get their body across, maybe use of the arm a side-on shape so they can be strong with a real strong base. Some players not often used to having contact, so just getting them used to that. Yeah, 100%. Again, um, in regards to that disguise, not necessarily always coming in front, but sometimes looking to disguise behind so they can receive that ball maybe on a diagonal behind the player. So if they start really deep and behind that player, that player needs to hear communication left or right from the goalkeeper, and that way they can receive that ball from the diagonal. Again, like you mentioned, the anticipation, if they then get that ball as a pivot, usually they'll they'll put their bums out first to, to hold off that contact. And then once that ball is in play and they have that ball, they'll probably stand up vertically. So it becomes much more difficult for that player to, to be tackled, as opposed to if you're down and your body is, is low to the floor, it becomes more difficult for you to turn with the ball as well. So the more vertical they are, they have to have a real strong core because they are vertical and easier to push over. But at the same time, they want to be a threat that they can roll and shoot inside. So you can start to see the strength of pivots like Farrell, Solano, who can stand upright and people are still not able to, to push him off the ball, even though his centre of gravity is quite high and not low. And the way they hold their ground, that all allows them to hold their ground. What I mean by that is they don't come back. The ball doesn't come into them and they take back touches towards their goal. The ball comes yeah. into them. And if anything, they stand still or anything, take it back away from their own goal towards the opponent's goal because they've got that strength. And linked to those techniques, they've got that disguise and that ability to turn both ways so the defender's unsure. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So that, yeah. Developing players that can rotate both ways and faint to go one way with the ball and then roll it the other way, I think it's becoming increasingly important. Yeah, I say, and, and that, that key thing of timing, of, of allowing the other players either to come in or to attack yourself and knowing when to slow it down and when to speed up that process as well. Which is why they have to scan when they've got the ball and, and before. But, OK, yeah. what about when they haven't got the ball? Again, it's, bec it's becoming a lot more difficult for pivots. Pivots, especially because of the high-press scenarios, it's it's gone those years of 20 years ago when pivots were were not expected to defend or pivots were expected to, to offer some sort of cover in a low block, maybe. Um, now what you're starting to see is teams, again, attack those, those pivots a little bit more. So you can see Brazil defend man-to-man. -man, um, and you can see there that Ferrao is at the back of the court because... Argentina's fix, Maxi, has cut through there and dragged Ferrao out. And that means that they're going to be attacked a little bit more off the ball and they're going to be attacked on the ball as well. Um, being able to defend those situations, as well as pressing high up the court, um, is it, causing real challenges for, for as I say, the, the old school pivots that, that still exist. Um, so it's a key battle that, that they've got to work and develop on. And that's why you're starting to see what you could call maybe the, the modern pivots that are much more dynamic, much more quicker, much more agile, um, as opposed to yeah, 10, 20 years ago as well. OK, I'm just looking their movement in terms of their body shape and foot pattern. So if they're expecting that their player, their mark in the back player, or the fix is going to run, they've got to get themselves in a body position ready to track that runner if they're going to. Again, earlier, it might be the body contact they get to try and stop that run. Just looking at Farrell's foot patterns here, he's turned inside towards the goal. 
Yeah. Whereas he may turn the other way, so be facing the player. Don't know as a coach if you've got a preference to how you would work with your players if they're tracking runners. I think it's good that he's running forwards effectively and not backpedaling because that's another thing, yeah. isn't it? That if we're a pivot and it's they're running off us, we backpedal and we're running back and they're running forwards. It's good that we're side on. It's good that we're turning. Do you have a preference as to which way they turn, whether they're facing away from the goal or towards it? Um, I think they should always be facing, again, opinion, but I think they should always be facing towards, similar to what Farrell's doing at the moment. I don't think his body orientation is bad. I think that as long as he notices the player there and knows that the player is there, um, that's a good indication. And what he's trying to look now is at the ball and where the ball is coming from. Um, I think having your body orientated to try and see both is always a good thing. Um, becomes difficult when you're running towards your own goal. Um, so it's a real challenge. I think once they start to look at the player, it becomes very difficult then to know if the ball is going to come inside you for the diagonal or over the top. Um, so I think always trying to look towards your goal and look towards the ball and see where the ball is going as opposed to sometimes where your player is going, especially in those scenarios, um, for me would be key. Yeah, and I think that is an opinion thing and we might look at a slide in a minute and maybe it depends where you are on the court. If you're chasing into an area or if you're playing as a winger and you're players in front of you so that might have an impact as well but good for coaches to be thinking about what that means for them 100 okay wingers in possession yeah again like we said um before so we're starting to see wingers and back men start to finish a lot more outside the area um something that we're noticing in terms of these shots of the, the curvature of the runs um so not running directly towards the ball so number seven has played the ball there into to the false pivot or the or the winger that's come in and is now holding the ball for the set and the shot. And you're starting to see that number seven is moving firstly inside and then curving around to, to offer the shot there. Um, these curved runs, again, can either be to finalise, which is what, what we're looking at this, uh, this stage, or we're starting to see more curved runs um, in the creation phase as well um, in regards to how wingers start to screen for other players as well. Um, as opposed to before where vert uh, cutting was a little bit more ver uh, um, vertical, a little, bit, a little bit more horizontal as well. Okay. So just look, we'll come to the create in a minute, but just link to this finish, this example here. What, what, what does a curve run give the players, do you think, rather than running straight at that player who's got the ball? <laughs> so this seven here, rather than playing straight and running at him, why do you think they go off towards the other white-kitted defender <laughs> and yeah. come round? What do you think that allows them to do? It's to generate more space for themselves as well. So if you if you imagine that number seven running directly towards the ball and imagine just a straight line from that number seven directly towards the ball, you'd be going closer to the defender. By him stepping away and curving his run means that the defender has to um, displace themselves a little bit more as opposed to if that player was running um, straight towards the ball. At the same time, what it allows that player to do is if that defender now jumps in regards to towards where that player is running, it means that that defender can readjust and maybe go for, for the movement in behind as opposed to in front. Um, so what that means is if that, that white, uh, the white player jumps across, so the, the Moroccan defender, then the number seven um, would readjust and then go in behind. Yeah, back down the line, come yeah, back, back on down the line to so readjust yeah. their movement. So it gives them that extra little bit of time as well as space that. to be able to to readjust. Um, and if not, it gives them more space in the first phase to be able to finalise there. Yeah, and I'm looking at this thinking there's potentially, if he does get that set to him, the angle of approach to strike the ball, he's probably, we've talked about these first time shots coming from distance. If you're running straight at that ball and it comes back at you, it might be hard to, to get the angle of where the ball is to your foot to shoot. Whereas if it's outside a little bit more, he's got a better angle of approach to strike the ball, possibly. Yeah, hundred percent. Again, it will go down on in terms of foot that you're planting down to be able to shoot. It probably gives you, as you said, a better angle to be able to readjust your feet to be able to strike that ball first time. Okay, so that's looking at how they're curving their runs to maybe play forwards and run forwards. You mentioned about create. Got a little video here to talk in the create phase about. We're looking at the winger on the other side here, this blue teal winger on the other side, how they curve their run across. Uh, yeah. No, we're not. We're looking at the pink and purple, sorry. Yeah, pink so very purple. similar to the to the curve run in the finalising phase. Um, 
so predominantly in the, in the past or a lot of people will have worked on this a very similar movement to this where that pink player as opposed to curving around in front of the defender would come directly into the pocket um, because we're starting to see more pressurised situations now where defenders are getting tighter to the ball these players now need to be able to offer support passing lines as well as trying to disguise and surprise the defenders. So what this curved run does in front of the defender, number one, it causes an imbalance there in the defence. So you can see that the players either follow or exchange, and that's a real challenge for those two players. If they follow, then, it, then the other player might be free over the top. If they exchange again, there'll be a moment there where the player who's in front, the pivot and marking, will not know that that player is coming around and that causes a, a sort of a moment of relapse. So if they did exchange that one and that player stayed with the other player, um, then all of a sudden we've got a split second moment there where the, the opposition team have gained an advantage. And finally, like I said, it offers that security in the pass if that fix drops a little bit deeper to be able to switch that in terms of a screen. So again, this uh, and, and I've seen players do this not just once but twice. So they'll curve, they'll go all the way round, and then the ball will get switched to the opposite side on the run all the way round again. Um, something that Adolfo does a lot for Barcelona, um, very dynamic across the court in creating these safety passing lines for the back players um, on the court. Yeah, and no, I'll just try and stop it as we see as he comes across or she comes across there. That's that sort of protection, isn't it? So if the ball gets passed across to the pink or purple who's gone to the other side, it potentially goes behind that player. And like you said, the pinky purple on the far side would just drop a little bit and then it creates a safe pass. Yeah, at the same time, if that ball goes into the pivot, for example, the player that's opened up wide can now gain that spatial yeah. advantage behind. But the real a diagonal key to... pass, yeah. 100%. But the real key to this is the change of speed and change of pace. If that a uh, pink player comes in at the same speed all the way through. Um, that'll be very easy to either exchange or follow. If that player slows down as they're coming in and then speeds up on their way out, it causes real issues there for the defence to either exchange or follow. Yeah, great point. Linked to timing. Yeah. Movement. Excellent. Go on then, out of possession, the wingers? Yeah, very similar. So issue with the wingers is now you're, you'll either find yourself on the on the front line of defence um, or on the back line of defence, so offering two very different scenarios. So you'll either be pressing very high or you might be acting as cover in those defences when we talked about with exchanges. Um, so you can see here that the winger that we've got circled is in a 1v1 scenario higher up the court in the first line. And then potentially you'll have one of those two back players there um, in white, that will be one a winger as well. The other one will be a back man, and they'll find themselves in a very different um, scenario, which is either a cover um, scenario as well. So two different scenarios to deal with in, within the same play. Um, now, in regards to what they're what they're looking to do in regards to one v one battles that we spoke about before, they'll usually be the ones that are isolated and have to deal with those one v one scenarios defensively. So you can see that it's important that they maintain a low low body um, position there, centre of gravity low, on your toes. So you can see that player defensively is on their toes. Um, even though the image is quite small, it's very apparent that. Knees slightly bent, head towards the chest area usually um, in regards to where that player is going. Hand, hands out wide as well. So you're looking as wide as possible and really being able to then to readjust so your feet aren't flat and you're not square on that you're able to be beaten 1v1 scenario as well. Yeah, very good. And it's about getting there quickly as well. We've got here timing of approach. Anticipating, I think, is important. So if that ball's come across from the other player, it's anticipating, can you get there as the ball arrives? So the closer you can get, potentially, as the ball arrives, you've got more chance of, if we can intercept, brilliant. If we can't intercept, we're then touch tight and making it harder for them and maybe getting them to face their own goal. Whereas if we don't anticipate it and we wait for the ball to get to his or her feet before we then come to the ball... They've got, they can dictate, they can have a first touch forwards, they can put you where they want and um, link with their teammates. So, yeah. And that's where his, and that's where his or her job becomes really crucial. So the opposite defender who's just play, who's just defended that other pass, if your body orientation is showing the player one way, it means the second defender or the third player can anticipate that pass a little bit more because of how you've adjusted your body, 
the passing line that you've shown the striker to take or the, the attacker to take. And that way it gives your second or third defender a better chance of anticipating that next pass. Brilliant. Okay. Fix or the back player? What, what did you start to see them doing in possession? Again, becoming much more mobile, um, attacking the court a lot higher and a lot wider as well. So as we saw with those, um, the curtain movement that we saw in the curve movement before from the winger, that fix is opening up into more wider areas. Uh, sometimes being the player that will drive and dictate the 1v1s, as well as the player that will find that, find that pivot pass or finalise as well. So we're starting to see fixes score a lot more goals from outside the area. So they'll be the ones that will come in to, to finalise as well. And in the image, what you can see there, the same one that we saw before where Farrell was defending, that that attack uh, that attacker is effectively the fix who has attacked Farrell off the ball. So he would have played the ball. Farrell now is his man. He's uh, following through and attacking the space in behind, which means that the fixes are isolating the pivots in defensive scenarios. So you can see that pivots defensively will be more or less the weakest player on the court. And that way the fix is on having to become the player that attacks the spaces in behind um, to create those 1v1 battles um, where they see the advantage. Um, so that, that that's what they're starting to do and therefore Scott starting to score a lot more goals as well. Mm. So all that stuff we talked about earlier around shooting and different types of finishing becomes important for these players. That we've got there about the timing of the movement again. You've mentioned it already about that slow to fast to engage other players and scanning. They're, they're known, aren't they? The fixes, the back players, as the ones who read the games really well. And it's important when we've got the ball that they're scanning to see when to make those forward runs and when to support behind the ball or when to pull out wide. And as you said earlier, again, often it's dependent on the pressure on the ball. If there's good, if there's not great pressure on the ball and your teammates in control, you can make forward runs. So this example, possibly from a goal clearance, the keeper's got time because he's got the ball so we can make forward runs. If they're under pressure, well, I might not want to run forward because I'm leaving him with nothing or her with nothing. So I might support or or peel wider to give a, a more secure pass. 100% the fix, the fix becomes the most important player because scanning, like you just said, they're the ones that see the whole court in front of them. They see every player in front of them nine times out of ten. And therefore, what we're starting to realise now is that the fix should be the one to attack the space because they're seeing the space better than anybody. Whereas if you're the winger, the fix is behind you. You don't see the space in front and behind. You'll see some of the space. The fix will see everything that's going on in front and therefore be able to make a better decision based on that perception. Yeah. And then if they are finding themselves further forward, they might have to develop those other skills around receiving the ball back to goal and as a pivot and all that. So I come back to keep coming back to player development. Exposing these players to a variety of positions and a variety of core skills is really important. When they haven't got the ball? Again, the the old role of being able to mark the pivot is uh, still very prominent and, and finding these situations where you can see there the player's got arm length um, on the back of Farrell. So low body, um, arm's length, not pushing because that's a foul, but as long as your arms are straight and on the back um, to let the pivot know you're there. But they're starting to, to anticipate those passes a little bit more. So marking either in front, um, behind or to the side. So trying to cut that ball out a little bit more um, as opposed to before. Um, as well as tracking the runs. So again, like we said, becoming a lot more mobile as as before, the, before they used to be. Um, and again, having that, say, low touch tight angle, agility and ready to block um, in regards to the the pivot. So if that pivot turns, they aren't too tight that they'll be able to get rolled. Yeah. They're just tight enough that it can roll and they can block the shot as well. Yeah. Good. Okay. Last two then, goalkeeper. Yeah, that's a really crucial position. Um, we're starting to see it evolve more and more um, within futsal environment. Um and the, and the football environment as well to, to, to blend it uh, wherever we can, um, which means that, again, goalkeepers come better with their feet. So you've got Higuita, renowned for for being a, effectively an extra player. Um, Barcelona have got Didac as well that they utilised throughout the whole season in pressure situations and higher up the court situations as well, able to score a large amount of goals in, this, in the Spanish league. So what we're starting to see is that these players are, are supporting if the pressure is good enough, which is what we initially started with our observations, is that high pressure moments and 
um, teams pressuring high up the court as well. It means that they're starting to use the goalkeeper out of, um, to get out of that pressure. But again, they're starting to use the keeper a little bit higher from, from side kick-ins, all of that to create slight 5v4 advantages and fly keeper scenarios. We know that fly keeper will usually be an outfield player um, when at the end of the game. But in these scenarios, it's just a mini fly keeper, which the keeper attacks and effectively will either find themselves on the wing, or in this case, Iguita, who, who likes to play centrally because of his capacity to be able to shoot from from outside of the outside of the box. And this is a goal um, in terms of this scenario as well to the back post. And you touched on it there. We've got techniques, the range of passing techniques, short and long, and shooting that they'll require if they're going to start being a bigger part of the game when the team have got the ball. We need to make sure that we're developing players who have got that range of passing, short and long, and can strike the balls in all the different ways we've we've already discussed. I think you made an interesting point here around basing decisions on player strengths. Yeah. What What did you mean by that? Um, it's really to know what the other players on court are and how they want that ball. So uh, generic rule or what we will usually say is don't try and play the ball through the middle of the court, whereas high level team is split. The keeper's got the ball at the back of the court and that that keeper will play the pass through the centre of the court to direct to Farrell, for example. We know that Farrell is strong. We know that Farrell can hold that ball up and therefore that's where he wants the ball. It doesn't make any sense for me to clip that ball into space or any other, any other decision. That's really recognising who the players are and what type and quality of pass that player wants on the ball. Again, we talk about players starting to run in behind a lot more. So that links to that range of passing techniques where the players can offer in short and will have to offer a certain type of pass or those clips balls into space behind. And those the accuracy on those needs to be near enough, near perfect um, to get that timing right as the players approaching the ball. Yeah, great point. Okay, I think this is our final one before our final session. So goalkeepers out of possession. I think you mentioned earlier about um, the goals not coming from inside the D. And one reason possibly was the incredible reflexes and agility of goalkeepers to get across their line and make blocks. Is that something yeah. you, you would agree with? Yeah, 100%. Like you see more and more keepers have specified uh, sessions with their coaches. So they'll work in and around the area a lot as well. So they're starting to become masters of the back post save, masters of close range shots, because that's what they're practicing more more than anything. Um, so Higuita, Bebe, all of those made some incredible back post saves, last ditch saves, um, all of those in regards to either splits or Higuita, who, use, who uses the simple dive technique a lot as well. Um, so those shots are starting to come a lot more outside the area. You can see here the positioning of Big Wieser in a 1v1, how aggressive it is on that line. Um, you could say just outside the box, but it is quite aggressive. And therefore, again, the angles are reduced. So the goals are starting to come from deflected shots from outside the area, um, shooting when the keeper is not set, shooting when the keeper can't see because they've got players in front. Um, and therefore, it's a lot more difficult to, to anticipate that. Whereas those back post saves, all of that, um, keepers are starting to get really good at anticipating those and if not, um, getting across their goals to be able to save those as well. And you mentioned the high position or more aggressive position. Again, linked back to what we started with, the high pressing man-to-man -man defence while the goalkeeper, I'm assuming, is is higher up. Yep, sweeper-keeper effectively as well. Um, I think this, this season in the NFS, it was one of the highest that I saw in terms of keepers being sent off for for a handball out the area or or a tackle out the area and stuff like that. And that's down to, again, is that keepers are expected to, to be able to cut out those those diagonal balls, those through balls, especially the teams that don't have cover because they're not defending with exchanges. The keeper is the, is the one that has to defend in case that player gets beat a lot of the time as well. So it, you might have a 1v1 against a player. If that player gets beat, it's all of a sudden now a 1v1 against the keeper. And that keeper's got to be effective and very, very good at those. Yeah, good. So just to finish then, we had a, a practice, a game you might play to try and develop some of the, the observations around shooting from outside the D and on a one touch. Here we've got a session that, that might allow us to work on some of those player or position specific uh, coaching factors really for the players. Yeah, 100%. So very, very simple. So splitting the, the court into thirds um, vertically. 
And that way, what it allows is uh, three 1v1 scenarios, for example. But then you can really be creative with it. So in terms of the 1v1 scenarios, if you've got a pivot in those scenarios, try and encourage them as they receive the ball to turn their bodies now and create a back-to-goal situation where they can set for the other players or they can turn themselves and shoot. So they really know their strengths. If it's a winger or if it's a fix, try and then work off that pivot or try and create those 1v1 scenarios where it's face-to-face. -face. What you can then do to progress it is take maybe one of those channels away and now it's a two-thirds and a third and you create a 2v2 and a 1v1. Um, and then you start to create different problems and solutions as well. So you start to create those 2v2s and how they work together with that 1v1 on the outside. You can flip that again um, for the opposite winger to do. Or what you can do as well is then start to work on those um, direct entries. So the player plays the ball into one channel and you allow that player to follow their pass in. Or the player plays the ball into the channel and another the opposite channel player comes in. So you're starting to work on different scenarios and how different players are starting to enter and support the other players. Um, so combining all the things that we've looked at, the curved runs, back to goal, facing goal, um, working with players of two, all of those little things that we've spoken about. The goalkeeper, yeah. So and then it's over to the coach with that practice to to focus on the player, the players that they want to. <clears throat> and hopefully there have been a few coaching points or observation things to, for them to look at that they can um, apply. So I think, John, all that leaves me to do is say thank you. Thank you for your time in in sharing with us your observations. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I hope people take something from it and I'm sure I'll see you on the circuit very soon. Yeah, thanks a lot for your time. And again, uh, thanks to everybody that took the time out to listen as well. Take care and best wishes for the season. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye, mate. Bye.